A few weeks ago, a good friend of mine who is an evangelical Christian came to visit me here at Holy Rosary. And when I was showing her around, we came into our worship space and she looked at our crucifix. And she said, that is a huge crucifix. And she said, why are you Catholics so obsessed with suffering and death? She said, don't you ever celebrate the resurrection? I think what she was trying to struggle to understand is the very thing that those who were murmuring against Jesus in today's gospel were trying to wrap their minds around. Because it can sound like what he's telling them, on one hand, is a little crazy. That he's this bread from heaven, that he's the bread of life, that the bread that he is to give, that they will eat, that will lead to eternal life, is his very flesh given for the life of the world. So on one hand, that just seems completely out there. That this man is going to give us his flesh to eat. And that somehow that's going to lead to eternal life. So that might be one reason why they kind of murmur against him. And we know that through this discourse in the Gospel of John, many people begin to stop following him because this is such a challenging notion. But I wonder if it's not just that it sounds a little crazy to the logic and rationality of our minds, but that what it challenges us to in our own lives seems like it might be a place that none of us really want to go. that we find eternal life through the encounter of the sacrifice of flesh. Because as we hear in our second reading, we are called to be imitators of God, who gave of himself a sacrifice, a fragrant aroma to God through his son Jesus Christ. When we come to see Elijah in our first reading, it looks like this very peaceful moment because he though has great despair, he collapses under the broom tree and he feels like he's failed at his mission, that he might as well just give up and die. And God nourishes him. But God doesn't give him that comfort to just sustain him in that place and tell him everything's going to be okay. Elijah's journey is a testament to our own journey of faith. That God sustains us in the midst of our struggles and our sufferings, our doubts and our uncertainties, all the challenges we confront in the course of our life. Not to take us from them, but to allow us to find transformation in them. And that can be a terrifying reality from the outside. But just like Elijah, it's very hard for us to avoid those moments in life. And if we look at the whole story of Elijah's journey, this one moment of rest where he awakens and finds the hearth cake and the jug of water by him to refresh him is one of the few moments of true rest he finds. He gets there because he's fleeing for his own life. He's just proclaimed the truth of the God of Israel and a lot of people didn't want to hear it. He confronted a whole system, a whole structure, a whole society that didn't want to change its ways. And so they come after him. So he flees into the desert. After he's nourished by the hearth cake and the jug of water, he continues for 40 more days in the desert to the mountain of Horeb. And when he arrives there, we encounter a very comforting moment in scripture where he's waiting for God. And God isn't in the fire, in the earthquake, in the wind. God is in the still, small voice. And it seems like at last Elijah has found his rest. And yet in that moment, what does God tell Elijah? He tells Elijah, get up and go back. Face your fate and find a successor. Appoint someone to follow you. After having served God so well, Elijah is told that your mission is to go and proclaim the truth until your own death. Toward an end that you will never see. Your mission is so much greater than your own self. That's his journey. 
That's what this hearth cake and this jug of water he finds gives him the nourishment for. The nourishment to continue on something that seems unimaginable and yet becomes an instrument for the salvation of God's people. As I look around today, I see many faces that I know have known great struggle, great disappointment, great hardship, great tragedy. And there's one family in our parish community that knows that particularly deeply this day. Many of you may have known our parishioner Yvonne Vasquez. She was a young and active, vibrant member of our community, taught in the RCAA program as a catechist, was a Norbertine associate. She and her daughter Sammy were involved in our family faith program. And Sammy is a very dedicated server here at Holy Rosary. And she passed away yesterday morning. She passed away after a long and arduous journey of sickness. Always with some hope that something would change. And in fact was waiting for the moment where she would receive a new liver. And yet her health took a turn. And that hope for a future never came to be. And in moments like this, we look at that and wonder, why? Why is it, God, that you bring such suffering to life? Why is it that life can end so soon? We may never know the whys of these experiences, but what we do know and what Yvonne's life testified to me in her own journey of faith was that we can uncover what God does in the midst of the trials and struggles that we encounter. Her life was a profound testimony to what it was to find those hearth cakes and those jugs of water in the midst of those moments when we feel like we cannot persevere any further. To see the movement of hope and grace that allows us to love in a radical and open and vulnerable way. Because she had to confront a truth that is true for all of us, though many of us choose to ignore it. And that's that our life is not our own, but it's lived for the sake of something greater, for the sake of those whom we love, for the sake of God. She knew that she had to love each day as though it may have been her last. And she did, giving radically and openly of herself. moments like these that remind us what the bread of life that is given for the sake of the world truly is and who Christ is in our lives and what he truly does and accomplishes. Because when we recognize that our life is called to be a life of giving and sacrifice, is called to be a life of love in the midst of everything that can cloud us, that our life in those moments when we turn inward and we find ourselves in despair under the broom tree and complete self-interest focusing on our own self-loathing and pain, that God will still nourish us so we can take the next step and offer ourselves again to those we love. It's in those moments where we feel like we finally escaped the chaos of life and all that bombards us forces us to listen to that small, quiet voice in our heart that reminds us that it is upon God whom we feast to find the nourishment that carries us to the next day. And it's in the midst of all of that that we see the true human reality of our lives and the lives of those around us. That as different as our lives may be, the one thing that does unite us is the challenges, sufferings, and struggles we face. May that be the conflicts we find in our marriage, the uncertainty of the future of our children, May it be our own health and struggles. May it be the loss of a spouse or a friend whom we've journeyed with for a lifetime. In the midst of all of that, it's in those moments that we can see with greater clarity what God offers to us when he lifts us up in the midst of our own deserts to nourish us, to feed us, and to inspire us that we may continue on to give of ourselves in a new way. For our life exists to be given for others. 
That's what we come here to receive and to be reminded of through the sacrifice of Christ, of what he gave to us for our sake so that we may give of that to one another. So that we may truly become what we receive, but we only discover that when we enter into the depth of our own brokenness and pain. It's in the midst of that that we come to truly live the Beatitudes. Those seemingly terrifying invitations of Christ. Because who joyfully leaps up and says that they want to have poverty of spirit and recognize their complete and total lack of control? Who says they want to be humbled and discover their own meekness? Who says they want to look at their own brokenness to the point of knowing the mercy they need that inspires them to share mercy? And yet when we encounter those parts of our lives, it's the very things that inspire us to act in justice, to give mercy, and to build peace. It's then, when we realize that we need the bread from heaven, that we need that which leads us to eternal life, that gives us a glimpse of who God is, not only now, but who God will be in eternity, that we find all that we have to give, to share, and to offer to one another. That becomes our great challenge. That becomes the challenge of this image of the one who is the bread from heaven that hangs above us. It's not to say that we are obsessed with suffering and death, but it's to say that we recognize that it's in the midst of the struggles and pains of our lives that we encounter the depth of God's love and mercy so that it can be shared with one another. That we find the vulnerability and the courage to extend a hand to each other that we realize that together, not alone, we are the body of Christ for this world. And when we see what God has done to carry us here and now, then we trust that, of course, he will journey with us across the threshold of death to all eternity. It's when we take the risk to recognize the image of Christ sacrificed for the world printed on our own hearts that we will know the joy of what it is to stand in the empty tomb.